I said this last week. The Bible says, if God is for us, who can be against us? And some of us would have to say, if my life currently looks like God is for me, God help me. Right? But it's true. It's true. And we're going to talk about what that suffering looks like this morning. The Bible says this in Romans chapter 8, verse 16. It says, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. Paul's been writing, I'm going to elaborate on this in just a moment and explain it to you. But Paul's been writing about having a relationship with Christ. Always remember Romans 8.31 comes after these verses, okay? Remember that. Remember that. Because we're going to grip on to Romans 8.31, but he's going to explain before it why that's so important. It sits over here, what if... If God is for me, who could be against me? It says over here, and it's very powerful, but some things happened before I got to if God's for me, who could be against me? And the first thing that he says in, in Romans 8, 16 is this. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. Listen to me. If you're saved this morning, if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, listen to me. If you have a relationship with Jesus, if you go, I don't know if I have a relationship with Jesus Christ or not. Listen to me. Listen to me. This is not Philip telling you this. This is Scripture telling you this. Listen. One of the ways that you can know and be sure of your salvation is the Holy Spirit will confirm it inside your spirit. You'll know. You'll know. The Holy Spirit will say, I got you. Now, he may say it a different way. That's how he talks to me, all right? But he may say, I got you. There's people that deal with doubt. But the Bible explicitly says this. If the Holy Spirit is in you, it testifies with your spirit, your soul, that I'm a child of the King. I know I'm saved, not because my mom says I'm saved, or not because this church says that, he, that, I, that I look saved. I'm saved because inside me the Spirit goes, I got you, man. Right. There's a guy that told me this. This is freebie this morning. There's a, there was a pastor that told me one day, there was two, day, two days I need to write down and remember because Satan can never take it from me. This has got to do with suffering. There's two days for me. Number one, or the, so it didn't in no particular order, but the day that I was called to the ministry, that I was called to preach, I need to know that day and understand what it was like because Satan can't take it from me. The call of God on a man's life is irrevocable. And I may do terrible stuff, I may do all this stuff, but God, this is what God's called me to do. Satan can't take my calling. The second one, or the first one, doesn't matter, is my salvation. Listen to what I'm about to tell you this morning. This world and this enemy can take a lot of stuff from you, but he can't take Jesus from you. Listen to me, he can make life so painful that it's just unbearable. You can be in here smiling this morning and dying on the inside, but listen to what I'm about to tell you. He could touch every aspect of your life, but he can't touch your soul. And the Spirit, listen to me, in suffering, sometimes that's all you have, is to know that you're a child of the King. So I would say this to you this morning if you're going, wait a minute, I don't know if I've ever, hmm, we need to settle that. We need to have that settled. And if children, now, I'm going to give you this, I'm going to break this all down. I know you're standing, just chill out. You say, we're not saying anything. I can see it. All right, so here we go. If children, heirs also. So the Spirit says that we are children of God. And if we're children, we're heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer we, with Him so that we may also be glorified with Him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. That the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. I'm going to say this to you and I'll share it with you in just a moment. But this morning when you got up and it was a cool 40 something degrees or maybe high 30s, whatever it was. And you walked outside and the sun was coming through that blue sky with the, the Jim Ross white clouds. And the wind's blowing those old oak trees and the leaves are starting to change just ever so slightly. And that cool wind's touching your face and you go it's beautiful the the bible teaches us right here that spiritually speaking you do not have the eyes to see that creation is crying out for god to return listen to this you've never seen god's greatest work in creation that there's coming a day you anyways i gotta keep reading i'll tell you and not only this but also we ourselves having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. For in hope we have been saved. 
That's the grace part. But hope that is seen is not hope. For the hope, for who hopes for what he already sees? This is what makes suffering so hard. But if we hope for what we do not see with perseverance, we wait eagerly for it. God, I love you. Teach us great and wonderful things this morning. Minister to our hearts and our minds. I have no doubt, I know for a fact, within the sound of my voice this morning, there are men and women, many, many men and women, who are personally suffering during this time or watching others suffer. God, I pray that you'd move greatly. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Suffering, man. Nobody wants to preach on suffering. I don't like preaching on suffering, right? I like preaching. If, if you know me, I'm an optimistic person. In fact, sometimes I'm so optimistic, people have to keep an eye on me because I get way out there, right? So when I start talking about suffering, I don't like it. I don't, I don't like to talk about it or deal with it. But I, here's what I want to say on the front end of this, and I'm just going to kind of talk to you this morning, and I'm going to preach, and it's going to be good, is this, that suffering is subjective. Suffering is very subjective. That when we th- use the term suffering, um, it, is, it has a subjective understanding to it. That what you're suffering through, I might look at and go, oh man, that's a piece of cake. And then what, what, what I'm suffering through, you might say, I don't know how you're holding it together. Suffering is very subjective. You can take the same thing and give it to two different people and they'll handle it different. Some people will go through that and it will rip their lives apart. And we spend time around them trying to build them up, trying to take care of them. We're on the phone going, I'm worried sick because that thing is shredding them. You take somebody else, they might go through the exact same thing, and we are just absolutely stunned that they held it together like they did. And they'll say things like this, well, you know, I just put all my trust in Jesus, and I did all this stuff, and you know, you know for a fact it was hard, but suffering is subjective. There's some of us in here, you'd say, this is what I'm suffering with. And when you compare it to cancer, or you compare it to death, or you compare compare it to addiction, you would say to yourself privately, or maybe even publicly, you would say, I'm sorry, I feel even kind of silly talking to you about what I'm suffering with, with, with you suffering with what you're suffering with. Listen to what I'm about to tell you. It doesn't mean you're not suffering. It doesn't mean it's not real. And it doesn't give us the freedom of being able to say, well, my suffering is more than your suffering. Suffering, suffering. And we all face it at different times in our lives, and we all face it over different things in our lives. It could be your children. It could be a broken relationship. It could be the addiction that you're trying to get away from, but you can't. It could be the fact that the doctors called you in and gave you bad news. It could be the fact that she left or he left. It could be all of them together. It could be the fact that you're at a place in your life and you're not even really sure what God's calling you to do or who you're supposed to be. It could be a place in life where you're just lonely and you don't know who's going to walk through life with you. It could be that you got laid off at work. It could be that you got a job that you don't like. Suffering is subjective. You may be sitting with the person that you're suffering through. You may be sitting in here not personally suffering directly, but you're suffering for someone else. It may come through enabling. It may be coming through things that are happening to you without your consent. Suffering is subjective. And the interesting thing about suffering is, as a pastor, and I say this to each one of us, is we don't know how to handle suffering. You want to say, well, thank you, Philip. I appreciate you pointing out that fact. I'm not talking about when you're going through it, you don't know how to handle it, although we're going to talk about that for just a moment. But if you think about it for just a moment, if it's not you that's suffering, but you know someone that is, and currently you're not, you're not suffering, but you're watching someone else or multiple people or whatever, and they're going through this thing, and you know that they're miserable, that they're hurt, that they're shaken, that they're confused that they're they're suffering you don't know what to do you don't know what to do you don't know how to answer it you don't know how to help them you don't know what to text them you don't know what to say to them you don't know you don't know what to do they're suffering you don't know how to ease the pain of suffering you don't know how to take it away but you long to so as you begin to walk through this suffering thing it's so uh, weird if you got a friend and you text them and say, hey, man, I just want to you know I'm with you, I love you, but you can't take it away. And if you're suffering, you realize that there's nothing nobody, anybody can do for you. In fact, sometimes over time you get tired of hearing about it. In fact, sometimes if you're suffering, you know what you do? You stop going places. You stop being around. You hide. 
You run. Can't talk about it right now. Won't you go down here with me? I'm not going. Why don't you want to go? I don't want to talk to anybody. You know what you're doing? You're suffering. The problem is, is you can't fix it. And now you know no one else can either. Suffering's weird too because you can suffer and not be able to fix yourself. No one else can fix you. But the fact that no one else can fix you, you'll hold it against them. And you'll say, in my worst days, you weren't there. No one helped me when I was down. And the truth is, is you're probably right. But the other truth is, is probably this. They couldn't have helped you if they wanted to. Because you couldn't even help yourself. Suffering's wicked. It's defeating. It takes away hope. It ruins your day. You struggle with it for seasons. And we end up building walls around it. Suffering. And the Bible says, if God is for us, who can be against us? And you come to church for a couple of weeks, and this little slick headed preacher's up here going, If God's for you, who can be against you? What shall we say to these things? If, it's for, if God's for me, who can be against you? And you leave, and you're still suffering. And you're dying on the inside. Some of it's quiet, and some of it's known. But you're suffering. You're battling. The war is raging. And what we're looking for is grace. So it's been going on recently for me. I've been paying close attention. This is kind of a personal thing because I'm, I'm really kind of, I've, I've watched and I've, I knew where I was headed this week during this series. But just most recently, over the past several weeks and months, I've been having conversations. I've been around people and I've just begun to see that season of suffering coming around. And different people at different places are struggling with all kinds of different things. And my heart as a pastor breaks. Because there's only so much that I can do. There's only so many things that I can do in a hospital or in your home or in a church. I'm not a fixer, even though I'd like to be. I can't fix anybody. I can pray for you, but I can't get you through it. And there's a song that comes to my mind when I think about suffering. There's a song that comes to my mind when I'm suffering myself, and it's a song that's a hymn. It's my favorite hymn. It's a hymn that, that you'll all know. And in fact, when you sing this hymn, this church would come alive. In fact, if I started singing it right now, which I will not, because you will all suffer if you weren't suffering before. But if I sing this hymn, it begins to minister to you. And I think about this hymn, and I think about what it's all about, and then I read Romans 8, and Romans 8 begins to talk about the fact that we have hope, and we have hope in Christ and we have hope in what we can't see. And, he, and Paul says, but if you're hoping, you're suffering, you're holding on to something that you can't see. What kind of hope is that? That's not hope. The hope is in something that you can't see. And really what Paul is saying is, Paul is saying, we need grace. Jesus, I need you to show up and show grace. I'm suffering to the point that I need you to intervene. Jesus, I need you to be a what-if God right now. I need help. I don't understand why. I don't get it. I don't know why. I don't know why this is happening. I don't know what's going on. I need grace. My grandfather, before he died, I told you this, and it's one of the words that hangs in my mind. And I didn't know it was probably the most... Maybe it hangs because I've used it more than any other words, right? But my grandfather, before he went into the surgery, he never came out of. I loved, I loved him. He had lung problems, and he wasn't old enough to die. It was routine surgery. He had an oxygen mask on. And I went in there, and there he laid. He's kind of like me. He liked his hair combed a certain way. He liked his pants pressed a certain way. Taught me how to shine my shoes. You know what I'm talking about? I always had change in his pocket, rattling it. I was like, why you got change in your pocket, rattling it, people? Because it makes me feel like I got money. Right? That's <laughs> I don't have any change. I ain't got no money. All right, so I was in there, and I went in, and the oxygen, shh, it's blowing. It's the mask, not the hose. It's the mask, shh, blowing in him. And I said, don't say anything. I said, I just want to come see you before you went back to surgery. I said, I'm going to be here, and I'll see you when you get out. I just want to see you for a minute. He took that mask, and he pulled it this way. 
and he stood it up here and he looked over at me. He couldn't really move all that well, but he looked over at me. He said, JP, his grace is sufficient. I said, I know it is. You know when people tell you something, you know, like it doesn't hit you how powerful it is at the moment. I'm like, I know. I know. You know me. I'm like, I know. It wasn't like I had a moment where I fell apart and broke down and went, oh, my gosh. I just went, I know. And when it didn't come out, Grace, I need it. I'm hurting. <laughs> and I can hear him, it's sufficient. And there's a hymn that comes to my mind when I suffer, when you suffer, when I watch you suffer. It's called Amazing Grace. John Newton wrote the song Amazing Grace, and I want you can Wikipedia it or look it up for yourself. If you don't know the backstory to Amazing Grace, you ought to, because it's a fantastic story. This man, John Newton, um, was a, just a rebel, rough, I mean, just, he was a bad boy. Ended up getting in the British Navy. He worked on slave trading ships. He was on his first one called the Greyhound, and they would uh, capture slaves and bring them back and sell them. But he was so rough and so rugged and nasty that even he got left on the island a couple times and had to be picked up and um, just a rough guy. So he ended up being the captain of his own boat um, and doing in the slave trade industry. He got sick and God began to change his heart. He ended up surrendering his life to Jesus Christ, left slave trade industry, became a minister or pastor. And he devoted the rest of his time not only to working with congregations but to leading uh, the ending of the slave trade practice. He personally was a part of that. During the ministry time, though, he wrote the words to what has now become known as one of the greatest ever hymns of all time. It's Amazing Grace. And when I've, I'm going to read you the words, and when I read it, you can't help but sing it in your mind. When I begin the words of Amazing Grace, your mind and your heart are going to begin to sing it. You're going to begin to think about it. You're going to go to that little white country church that you were at. You're going to see it there. And a lot of us think of about amazing grace, about the, it's just the grace of salvation. It is the grace of salvation. It is the grace of which John Newton spoke of about his salvation. But it is the, it is the grace of suffering that he speaks of too. And sometimes when you sing amazing grace, it isn't just about the fact that God saved you. It's about the fact that God will keep you. That in this moment, I need God's riches at Christ's expense, grace. I mean, isn't that what we pray for at the end of service? Isn't that what we ask for? That God would bring grace. So listen to it. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. The sweet sound is grace, by the way, in case you're wondering. See if... If I had JT come up here and strike it up, hit Amazing Grace, and he starts into that, whatever he does, and we say, um, hey, here we go. I'm not going to do that, okay? It's so bad. Grace, right? And then you can say, how sweet the sound. The sound that he's talking about is not your singing, it's the grace. Are you with me? Sweet. That God would offer grace. How sweet the sound. That save a wretch like me. What does it mean by wretch? He means soul. John Newton, when he wrote this, he's writing about himself. And he looked at the cross. He looked at the throne of Jesus. And he said, this grace, oh, there's not a sound that's any sweeter than when somebody uses the word grace. Because it saved a wretch like me. <laughs> and I can come in here this morning and I go, God knows me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I... Y'all singing it? See. So you're singing it in your mind. Don't sing it out loud. Lord, help us. Don't do it. But in your mind, you're singing it. Are you traveling with me? Some of you in the old country church. Some of you can see the quartet singing. Some of you may have even had it on in your car this morning. That's the salvation grace. See, he's, he's wrote a song about the, the grace of salvation. 
He, he saved me when I was this old wretched soul. I know who I was, and he saved me. But in case you didn't know who I was, let me tell you who I was. I was lost, pal, but he found me. I was blind, and he opened my eyes to finally see. I don't know about you, but that makes me excited. That's great. But he didn't stop there. See, that's only one part of the story. We get people saved. We lead them to a place to where amazing grace. That is fantastic. But there's more to the story. And the, the story is, is there's more to your life. There's things that come up. There's things that happen that you need to be prepared for. Because suffering will ensue. And when you're suffering and when you're struggling and when you're dying and when you're, you heard you've got cancer and when she leaves you and when uh, he leaves or when addiction happens, when you can't kick that habit, when, when your children don't respect you, when you're struggling, normally you're not standing there going, amazing grace, how sweet the sound has saved a wretch like me. Normally you're going, I know that part. But I need that saving grace. Save me. Now. That's why he kept, he kept writing. T'was grace that taught my heart to fear. And grace, watch this, my fears relieved. Now that's amazing grace. Some of us in here, you're suffering with fear. You don't know how it's going to turn out. You don't know how life's going to look. You don't know if you're going to make it. You don't know if they're going to make it. You don't know what's going to happen. And you're fearful. You're suffering with fear. It's on your mind. You're obsessed with it. You can't think about it. You can't talk about things. You are absolutely riddled with fear. And your soul says, Grace! Soothe my soul. And John Newton said, That grace, your fears will relieve. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. It was instantaneous. When you met Jesus, you got all of him in the moment. We're not done yet. Now listen, you want to talk about grace? The Lord had promised good to me. Well, when you're suffering, it don't feel like it, does it? In fact, you might be suffering and going, I don't know what I did so wrong. You might be suffering and going, I don't know why nothing good ever happens to me. See, this is why you need grace. But grace comes with a promise. The Lord hath promised good to me. His word, my hope, secures. My hope in this grace is secured around His words. I'm suffering but I'm clinging to what I know to be true. And his word says that he'll never leave me nor forsake me. Isn't that true? He will my shield and portion be. That's what some of us need to be right now. We need grace. We need him to be our shield. We need him to be our portion. And listen to what he writes. As long as life endures. You know why John Newton wrote that? It's because it's one thing to be saved through grace. It's another thing to be sustained through grace. Some of us in here are suffering and we're going, Jesus, I need you to shield me. You need Jesus to show up and say, I'm with, I got him, I got him. Back off. I'm the shield, I'm the grace, I got them. You've been falling on your face and you've been praying, God, I need you to show up. I'm struggling here, I'm suffering. God, I need you. What you need is grace, friend, to be the shield. And listen to what John Newton says. He says, for as long as... As life endures. What's he talking about? John Newton knew something when he wrote these words of amazing grace. He knew that it was one thing to be saved. That's forever. But it's another thing to walk this earth as a saved individual suffering. Because during my suffering, for as long as my life endures on this planet, I need Jesus Christ to shield me and be my portion forever. And then this is when the church kind of gets happy at the end of this song. And they really get loud. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun. And that's even when you boys aren't tenors, you start to get to be a tenor right then. Right? You're doing it in your mind right now. You just changed octaves. Right? We've no less days 
to sing God's praise than when we first begun. It's amazing grace. I could have JT play it right now and you'd come alive. In fact, at the end of this service, my friend Beth's going to play that song over you. And the reason that she's going to is because I'm going to teach you something for the next few minutes and then I'm going to pray over you. Because here's the deal. There's some of us within the sound of my voice that you're a visitor. You go, is it like this every Sunday? No, not really. This is a different kind of Sunday. Am I always like this on Sunday? Yeah, really. Always. But this morning we're talking about suffering. We're talking about the fact that there's some of us in here that need that amazing grace in our life. And we need Jesus Christ to show up. We need God to be our shield. We need Him to be our portion for as long as life endures. That there's some of us in here, our hearts are broken, our minds are distracted. Our future seems bleak. Life is wearing us out, and we suffer. So what's it look like? Well, let me show you Romans 8. Let me just teach you a little bit about suffering here real quick. All right? Because we're not good at it, but the Bible talks about it. So the Bible teaches us about suffering in Romans 8. Paul begins to write in Romans, 16, Romans 8, 16. He says, The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. Listen to what the Bible begins to teach us right off the bat. The first thing that he begins to show us is, is this, is that the Spirit himself will testify inside of you that you know Christ. That one of the things about life, about the spiritual life, and about being saved, listen to me, I still use that terminology. Uh, maybe you're looking for somebody a little bit more new school, but I'm not him. I ask a question like this, have you been saved? Have you been born again? Have you ever had a life-changing experience with Jesus Christ? Do you have a relationship with him? And the Bible says this, Now I want you to see this, because if you're ever going to understand suffering, you've got to get this point first. The Bible says that the day that you recognize Jesus Christ, remember what Amazing Grace says? That when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining, bright shining as the sun, right, we're going to continue singing just like when it first begun. Listen to me. On the day that you come to know Jesus Christ, whether that was at vacation Bible school, that was at your home, that was at your church, it was at an altar, it was in your car, it was at some event, whatever. In that moment, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell inside of you. And the Holy Spirit, the day of salvation, in that moment, instantaneously, when I first believed, instantaneously, the Spirit comes to dwell inside of me when I repented of my sins and began this relationship with Christ. And the Bible teaches me a couple of things. Number one, it teaches me this, that part of me knowing I'm saved is the fact that the Spirit testifies to my spirit. What does that mean? To my soul, to my mind. I know. How do you know you're saved, Philip? I know I am. Who told you you're saved? The Spirit did. Well, what did it sound like? Well, for me, he was like, I got you. That's me. We understand each other. I know he's inside of me. Listen to what I'm about to tell you. I'm not trying to get something started in here. You can have a Sunday school teacher. You can have a mom or dad. You can have a pastor. You have a choir leader. You can have a co-worker. You can have a friend. They can all testify that you're saved, but that will do absolutely squat for you spiritually. The only one that needs to testify that you're saved is the spirit that's within you. You with me? And if you don't know that to be certain, listen to me. If you don't know that to be certain, you've been battling with that, and you go, that's, that's exactly, I don't know, man. I mean, I, I don't know. Listen, you can settle that. You can settle that. You can settle that today. Now, let me tell you something else. You need to know this part to know the next part. See, some of us begin to say this. Watch. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. Okay? So now he is testifying. And say, I'm, a, I'm a child of God. Listen to me. You become a child of God the day that you are saved. You are a child of God. Listen, you don't become a child of God just because you were created. Uh, at that point, you're just a creature. You're a creation of God. There's people that say this, say, well, we're all children of God. No, we're not. Listen to me. Listen, put your thinking brain on. No, we're not. Well, we got to be careful now. We can all disagree, and they don't have to know Jesus like I know him, and blah, 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 whatever, and all this stuff. We're all children of God. No, they're not. They're creations of God. You are created by God. You don't become a child of God until the Holy Spirit comes in to your soul through salvation of Jesus Christ. At the day of salvation through Jesus Christ, then you become a child of God. And we all step back and go, yeah, I'm a child of God. Right? You ever been proud of your dad and said, yeah, I'm, 
That's my dad. That's what he says. You're a child of God. Now I'm a child of the king. If you know Jesus Christ is your savior, you're a child of the king. But let me tell you something else. The second part of that is, is this. He says, and if children, heirs also. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. If we stop right there in verse 17, we said, that's right. I'm a child of the king and I'm an heir with Christ. I am welcome in heaven. I know my savior and he knows me. I'm, listen to me, an heir. I'm in the family. I'm in the family. Like in just a minute when church is over, the Martin boys will come rolling in. My daughter will come rolling in. My daughter was standing here a few moments ago, Miss Beth, and Miss Beth plays, plays the bagpipes. And my daughter didn't see your bagpipes, but she saw your, your little thing there, um, it, uh, kilt. Uh, sorry, I couldn't, the word escaped me. I didn't want to say dress uh, because it's not, it's kilt. Uh, but she, and so my daughter was standing there, and she said, Dad, she leaned over when I said, and she said, Dad, um, uh, is that your guest today? I said, yeah. She said, does she do that little thing where she bends down and kicks her legs out like this? I said, uh, no. No, she plays the bagpipes. And we were laughing. You didn't know that we were laughing at you because in my mind I was seeing you do that little Russian dance. I was like, you're way off here, honey. That's the heirs of this guy. That's my daughter. That's my children. There'll never be a day in their life they won't be able to say he's not my dad. They may not want me to be their dad, but I'll always be their dad. They'll always be an heir to me. The Bible says that when you come to know Jesus Christ, you're an heir to him. Now listen to me. We've got to understand the perspective of suffering if we're going to know how to deal with it. If indeed children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified, with him. Listen to what the Bible says. The word if indeed is not a question mark if. The Bible's not saying if you're a child of God, if indeed you suffer. It's not a question mark if. It's a factual if. He's saying this. He says you're uh, the uh, child if children heirs also. If heirs of God, then fellow heirs with Christ. If indeed, meaning this, and you will, as an heir to the throne through God, you will actually suffer. Listen, Philip, why are you driving that point home? Because there's so many of us in here that think if we have a perfect relationship with Jesus Christ, if we go to church, if we get our spirituality in check, if we have a good set uh, moral compass, and we do all the things that Christ wants us to, we shouldn't suffer. In fact, most of us in here, if we're, if we're honest, we're human enough that when suffering begins to happen, we say things like this, I don't even know what's wrong. What did I do so wrong? You'll say things like this, I'm just real mad at God right now. And I'm going to say to you as a pastor, I understand. See, this is the why moment. This is the why moment in suffering. The why moment is, why is this happening to me? Why? Why? Like the friend of mine who said, I've worked my whole life. I'm going to retire. I think it's in six months. And just gets a diagnosis of terminal cancer. Why? Why? You roll home, and he's sitting on the front porch with his bags, and he leaves. And your life begins to suffer, and you go, why? You gave birth to two, three, four, five kids, whatever it might be. You've raised them the best that you could. You had them in church on Sunday mornings, and two out of the five are addicted to heroin, meth, pills, and you can't save them. And you go, why? What did I do so wrong? This is the why. You're struggling with something, and you can't, you can't get rid of it. You can't put it back in a box. You can't fix it. You go, ah, uh, why? Now, listen to me. As a pastor, I want to help. Because this is where we spiritually get lost. Many of us would get to the point of suffering hardship, whatever it might be. We get angry with God, which I understand. We get lost in this world of spiritual understandings because either A, we don't know what truth is, or B, we've been taught wrong. But if you know what the truth is, here's what you're going to find out. You are suffering 
exactly for the reason that you don't understand. And it's because you're an heir to the throne of God. You're suffering because you know Jesus. Why? Because you're an heir to the throne. Well, that don't make any sense. I don't get it. He's supposed to be a loving father. We go to church and they talk about what a loving God he is. And that he loves me. You mean he's going to let me suffer? Listen to what I'm about to tell you. It's not you that is under attack. It's him. This is where our suffering gets to be so human. See, watch. The Holy Spirit. I thought you were going to have to get this to get that. Now, stay with me. The Holy Spirit comes to dwell with inside of you. The Bible says it is no longer I live, but what? Christ within me. Understood? And we all go, yes, thank you, Jesus. He lives in me. No longer me, but him. We have no problem going to 2 Corinthians 5, 17 and say, behold, all things have become new. You know what the new is? It's him in you. That's the new part. But then on the outside of that, Remember, the Spirit testifies you're a child of the King. Yep, and the heir, yep, I'm right here. That's me, child of the King. Nobody has a problem with that. But on the outside of that is the prince of the power of this heir. And he's mean and he's wicked. He came to kill, steal, and destroy. He came to hurt you. His goal is to steal your joy. See, you're suffering this morning as a child of the King, and you don't have a stick of joy in your life. The Bible says that my king, the one that I became heirs with, that joy is abundant in him. Jesus Christ. And the enemy wants to destroy that joy. He wants to kill your family. He wants to kill you. He wants to mess everything up. That's why life's going along. It couldn't get better than this. And he throws a spiritual grenade in your life and disrupts everything. The problem is, I want you to see this, get this. The problem is, when you're suffering as a child of, king, of the king, the battle is between Satan and the spirit, but the person getting pinched in the middle is you. See, the Holy Spirit and Satan are battling. That's why Paul said in Romans 7, the things that I want to do, I don't do, and the things that I don't want to do, those are the things that I do. But I find this new law that is uh, evident in me that, that the Spirit wants to do what is right and, and, and flesh wants to do what is evil. The problem is, is I'm still flesh, I still have a mind, and I still have a heart. And when I'm fighting these battles, whether it's disruptions in my family, whether it's divorce, whether it's cancer, whether it's being fired, whether it's betrayal, whether it's addiction, whatever it might be that the enemy has crafted as a roaring lion to destroy me, he's battling the spirit that is in me because I'm an heir to King Jesus but I'm the one that's hurting. It's me. We say, why? But don't be too hard on yourself. Because when they raised Jesus up between heaven and earth, at the pinnacle of the execution, when it looks like death's going to win, he says, my God. What? And we come in here and our hearts are broken and our minds are grieved. And we suffer. And I go into a funeral and I love on the family. And tears roll down their face. And they suffer. And people walk in the hallways or in the church and they're a blended family now. And they suffer from the pains of the past. And they go home and they don't tell anybody. And we miss them for a few weeks because they got fired. And they don't know what they're going to do. And they suffer. And she comes in and she sits next to you at church. And she's so mad at you. She can't, she can't even put words on it. She is suffering in the relationship. Her heart's broken. No one knows. He promised again 
that he would never put that in his body because he's trying to kick that addiction. But he began to suffer so much that he took it again. And he sits here this morning going, I can't beat this. It's killing me. And he suffers. And we say, why? And Paul gives us perspective first. Perspective is this. The why is because of who you are. See, some people want to say, well, you better get your life right, man. Sounds like some things are going wrong in your life. God's out to get you. I had a buddy tell me one time, he said, God got him. No, I don't think so. I think the enemy's after him. That maybe you're crying out to the very one is the reason that you're going through what you're going through. And so Paul takes it, and he begins to take it, and he shares it another way. And then I'm going to pray for us, so I'm going to get you out of here. Because see, some of us in here, you're a child of the king, and you're asking why. But I'm just telling you this morning, you're suffering the way that you're suffering because you know Jesus. Not because he doesn't know you, but because he does know you. Not because he left you, but because he's in you. Not because he ain't listening, because he's walking with you. Not because you ain't good enough, but because he is the most powerful in all the land, and he lives inside of you. That's why you're suffering. And I want you to hear me. There's not words, there's not expressions, there's not a hug, there's not a card, there's not a gift card there's not a meal plan there's nothing i can do in that moment to take that pain away from you and paul if anybody knows about suffering it's paul and paul writes about it and he shares with us this is the reason but then he gives us perspective in verse 18 he says for i now that i know this i'm suffering and if anybody could talk about it, it should be paul but paul had his boat blow up in the water he had a dog paddle he was beaten and whipped listen to me five times the way that jesus was with the 39 lashes that's paul anybody knows about suffering it's paul you come in here remember suffering subjective but listen to me if we're going to look at words on suffering let's look at the one that probably has suffered more than any of us outside of jesus christ it's paul and paul says i'm suffering these ways can you imagine when he's getting beaten whip boom and he's going why you called me i was one of them i surrendered my life to you you made me blind and then the scales fall off you put me on a straight street you asked me to go preach the gospel i've been doing it i've been running for my life they're beating me why why he says this how do you deal with it okay so how are we going to do it for i consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Paul says, let me tell you something. I want to tell you how we're going to deal with suffering. Because some of you are heartbroken this morning. Some of you don't know. You're struggling. As a pastor, if I could just hug you up and fix you, I would. We're not being tough guys in here this morning. We're not. Look where tough guy got you. Got you to, sh to be quiet about what's killing you on the inside and isolated you so that you've grown bitter and dysfunctional in your life and losing the battle to what you're suffering with. However, had you realized as an heir to the throne of King Jesus that you're surrounded by other heirs of the throne and you're going to talk about what you're suffering with so while you're suffering for King Jesus, others could walk with you that you might actually get through this less scarred up than when the enemy pins you against the wall in your own weeping and wailing. No tough guys in here. And Paul says this. He says, all right, boys, here's how we're going to do it. When I consider, the word consider is a numerical calculation. That's what it means, numerical calculation. Paul says, when I look at my suffering, I do the math. And in the one column goes what I'm suffering with. And when I take this and put it on one side of the equation, I go, okay, this plus this, 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 this is my suffering. This is what I'm dealing with. But then when I look at what my suffering is compared to what I get out of it, which is heaven, which is Jesus Christ, which is the revealing of the why. Listen to what it says, reveal. What does it mean to reveal? He says, and compared to the glory that will be revealed, he's saying there's coming a day when all the wives will be exposed. All the pain will be fixed. All the things that I've wondered will be exposed. He says, when I think about what I'm suffering with, the, the pain, the hurt, the, the destruction, everything that I'm suffering with, the only way I'm going to get through my suffering is raising my chin to heaven and go, I've still got Jesus. I've still got Jesus. That's what Paul says. 
Paul said, they could put me through this, they could do this to me, but I've got good news for you. I've still got Jesus. For I consider the sufferings at this present time. When I look at these sufferings in this moment, I'm telling you, I need grace I need grace, and the grace that I have right now, nothing, what I'm suffering with, can't be compared to what I get. That right now, as I suffer, listen to me, can I, can I explain something to you? Right now, while we suffer, as painful as it is, as hurting as you are, listen to me, raise your eyes to heaven. He's there. He's free. Man can just absolutely press so much pain on you, break your heart, but they can't take Jesus. And as you walk through it, Paul says, I want you to understand, this is what's happening to me. I look at it and I do the math, and the math is what I'm going through does not even compute or compare to what I'm going to get. And then he goes on, he says these words, for the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly. For the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility. Not willingly. But because of him who subjected it in hope. What's he saying? Verse 19. He begins to show you the illustration. And then I'm going to pray. I want to show you what's going on. Paul begins to show you the reason behind suffering. He begins to show you how to deal with suffering. Is by raising your perspective. What's that mean? It means I know what I'm getting at the end of this. I'm suffering right now. I know that's waiting on me. But right now the only way to get through this. Is to look up there. The only way to deal with this is to look to heaven. See, if I'm in my suffering and I look what I'm going through, then I don't like what I'm going through. It, it's absolutely, it's not fair. There's all these whys. The only way to deal with what I'm dealing with right now is to keep my head to heaven. That at the end of the day, no matter whether this takes my life, whether this takes my future, whether this breaks my heart, that it may happen because I'm a child of the king. But I'm telling you right now, I'm not even looking at what I'm dealing with right now that I'm suffering through. It is absolutely destroying relationships. It's destroying my conversations. It's destroying everything. Thing. It's making me bitter, it's making me angry, it's making me fearful, it's ma making me all these things. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look up to heaven because nobody, no man, no thing can take King Jesus away from me. And he says, in case you're wanting to know what that looks like, here's what it looks like. He says, because if you don't understand that part, you don't understand this part because it would just seem kind of out of place. He says, for the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. You know what he's saying in verse 19? He's saying all of creation is suffering too. That in Genesis when God created the heavens and the earth. Listen to this. When he created the heavens and the earth he made it perfect. That when he created the stars and the sky and the water and the fishes. And all the things that he made that. And he put the garden of Eden right there. And it had trees and grass and palm trees and, and sun and the moon and the stars, and it was perfect temperature, was probably like, I don't know, 70 with a slight breeze and some good sun where you could get tan and not get burnt. You understand what I'm talking about? Like it was perfect. That's what he made. And then sin entered into the world. And sin enters into the world, and it changes all of creation. And Paul says this. Listen to what Paul says. Paul says, since that time, because of sin... The earth and creation has never been the same. That this morning when you walked outside and you felt the cool breeze of this fall air. And when the sun was coming through in that blue sky. And that big old oak tree that's trying to get its leaves to change. And all the leaves were just kind of blowing. You could hear them. And the acorns are falling. And the grass is still a little bit green but not so much green as it, as it was during the summer. And it smells like fall, and you can smell that, that, that person that's been burning leaves down the road. And you're looking up, and the wind's blowing. you got like a light sweater on, and you're standing outside going, Fall, man, that's where it's at. Doesn't get any better than this. It's beautiful. And you go up towards Townsend, and you go to Gatlinburg, and you drive across, and you see how all the colors are rolling on the hill. And it's oranges, and it's reds, and it's greens, and it's all these kind of things. And you're taking your picture, and you're putting it on Facebook going, It's fall, y'all. And you got a pumpkin. And you got all this stuff, and you go, man, it's beautiful. It's no, nothing can beat this. We wait all year for two things, to get beat by Alabama and take pictures of the leaves. We wait, and we do it, and it's beautiful. It's beautiful. You do it in the spring, too, when the daffodils 
come up and bloom and you put your children in there take their picture with an Easter basket or something it's beautiful can I tell you something listen to me because of sin you've never seen God's greatest work yet in creation you've not in fact the most beautiful tree that you've ever seen is nowhere near that's a sin covered tree you ever been walking in the woods and those little briar patches catch you around the ankle you go good well, who did that you ever grabbed a rose and said, that's the most beautiful rose? You know what? I don't understand why they make a rose and have thorns. Why does a rose need thorns? Sin. You ever wonder why ticks, ticks, ticks? Like God was just up there creating and said, you know what we need in the south? They're ticks. They'll love that. I mean, he was so far ahead of his time, you know, you know what I mean? Like he was like, and they'll deal with it for, you know, for several hundred years, and then some country dude will come around and write a song. They want you to search me for ticks or whatever that is, right? <laughs> He's so far ahead of it. You know what it is? Sin. But you've never seen God's best work. I'm going to give you something supernatural, and I'm going to pray for you because some of us in here are suffering, and I want to pray over you before we go. What you can't see this morning when you leave is the Bible says, For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the renew revealing of the sons of God. But the creation was subject to futility. That's what I'm talking about. The thorns, the thistles, the ticks, the mosquitoes. Because of sin, it all started. Not willingly. But because of him who subjected it in hope. That the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption. To the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. The word groan means someone is the utterance someone who's been caught in an unbelievably disturbing way in a dreadful situation it's the utterance that they make Ugh. like when you hear that you have cancer Ugh. when you hear they died Ugh. it's when you walk in and you have to tell him or her that secret and they just there's no words it's when you're looking at your addicted brother or sister or mom or dad or son or daughter and they're, they're losing the battle and you can't say it anymore. It's just, ah, uh, that's suffering. It's when you stand at the head of the casket and your friends come through and they hug your neck and they go, how you doing? And you go, uh. That while you said in the sound of my voice this morning and your heart's broken because of that thing, and I go, how you doing? And you go, I'm okay. But your spirit goes, ugh. That you suffer in such a way that the Bible says, I want you to hear me. The Bible says that when we fling these doors open in just a moment and we walk out of here and you see the wind blowing through the leaves on those trees, that what you can't hear is that tree and those leaves are going, ugh can't hear it in fact it says that they wait eagerly you know what it means it has the understanding of an outstretched head looking up on their tiptoes waiting eagerly for the return of God that when we go a few moments to the corn maze and all those corn stalks are standing up what you can't hear is all throughout that corn maze is uh, and see that those corn maze little those little stalks are looking to the creator that when the bird flies by, uh, when you walk on the grass in the springtime, uh, and when you sit by your best friend in church, their soul says, uh, amazing grace. Amazing grace. We have that grace for our suffering. So what I want to do for you this morning, come on, JT, is I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you. See, Paul writes in Romans 8, Romans 8, 31, if God is for us, who can be against us? But what Paul had to show us was through Romans 8 is that you are fragile. And the only way you can get to Romans 8, 31 is to realize that Romans 8 tells us that you can't do it on your own. It's why the Bible says that our spirit groans and the, and the spirit groans for us with utterances too deep for words. 
that he says all things work together for the good of those who love God. That the Spirit testifies that we are child of the King. That when we couldn't save ourselves, verses 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 tells us that we were hostile to God. That God did it for us. We are fragile. And this morning you are here and there's many of us you're suffering. There's things in life that I can do for you, but there's things in life I can't. And this morning, here's what I want to do. Is I want, here's all we're going to do for the next few minutes. Is I want to pray five prayers over you. And you may say, well, this ain't my thing. Well, buckle up, pal. We're going to do it either way. And I picked a way that we were going to do it. Because here's what I believe. I believe with all my heart. That as we suffer as a child of the king, I can still say to that thing. If God's for me, who can be against me? And I want to pray to my Jesus that he would move in my suffering. What if? What if God showed up in your suffering? And this morning, I don't know what it is, but here's how we're going to do this. I'm going to pray five prayers through the book of Psalms over your, over your life. And I picked a way to do this. I knew if I invited you to the altar, you would come. Um, but the problem with the grove is once I get y'all out of your seats to the altar, y'all don't go back. Y'all get right here and start loving and kissing and crying and all that stuff. And I'm going to try to finish and y'all are going to be a car wreck of just snot and slobber. <laughs> so here's how we're going to do this. I'm your pastor. And I love you. I love you. I wouldn't trade my job for any job on the planet. Listen to me. I wouldn't trade you for any congregation on the planet. Now, some of y'all know y'all. That's a big statement. <laughs> and your pastor, I don't use that word a lot. Normally, I just say, just call me Philip, because I'm just one of, of you, and you're one of me. I just get the opportunity to preach. But as your pastor, God says that I'm your shepherd. And there's things that a shepherd does. Sometimes a shepherd has to fight off the wolves. We've done that. And you know me. I'll fight. I showed up at this church fighting. And I've been fighting ever since. For you. Sometimes I have to fight off wolves. It looked like sheep. That's spiritual. Right? The problem when you fight off wolves that look like sheep is all the other sheep, all they saw was a sheep. They didn't know it was a wolf in sheep clothing until you get rid of the wolf that was in the sheep clothing. You understand what I'm talking about? Then all the sheep are mad at the shepherd. But if I had left them in the pack, they were going to eat your lunch. So I had to protect. But today's not about protecting. Today's about soothing and loving. I'll preach at funerals and I'll do your weddings. I'll dedicate your babies. Y'all have them. Lord, do you. We are a fertile church and I'm very thankful. I'll listen to you when you come to my office and we talk. But I'm just a man. I can't fix nothing. The greatest thing I can do for you is to pray for you. Not because you're at church on Sunday morning, but because you're my brother or sister in Christ, and I love you. And I want to pray for you this morning. And so here's how we're going to do it. We're going to pray because there's some folks that are really suffering in here this morning. Man, I'm telling you, at first service, we started, we got to this point, and they just fell apart now. Because they're hurting. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to have five things that I'm going to pray over. And when I call them out, we'll go right through it. When I call them out, all I'm going to ask you to do is if you're dealing with that, this is no time. You ain't got to be you know, silent. If you're dealing with this, I just want you to stand where you are. And I'm going to pray for you. And then we'll go to the next one, okay? But this morning I want to pray for you. So the Bible teaches us to pray, and I want to pray Psalms through you. So the first thing that I want to talk about is suffering through real quick. This won't take long. It's praying when you need answers and wisdom. You're suffering through decisions. And maybe you're here this morning and you're confused on the decisions that you need to make. You've got things that you're praying through. You don't know if it's God's will or your will. You don't know what the right move is or what the wrong move is. And you're struggling with it. It's on your mind. You can't think about things. You're just dealing with what's the right 
thing to do is. You're suffering through wisdom. If you're in here and you go, Philip, I need prayer over that. Would you just stand up? You can stand up by yourself, with your spouse, with your friends, anybody. I want to say something to you, okay? While you're standing, I'm going to pray for you. Just stay standing. The Bible says this, Psalm 27, 7. Hear, O Lord, when I cry, or when I pray, with my voice, and be gracious to me and answer me. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, O Lord, I shall seek. God's already told us to seek his face for wisdom. I'm going to pray this morning that as we pray to him, you're seeking his face, that he'll give you the wisdom that you need in the decisions that you need to make. I don't know what decisions you got going on. I don't know I don't know what it pertains to, but I want you to know that I love you, and I want to pray scripture over you. And everybody else that isn't standing, I want you to join me as we pray, all right? Just stay seated. Just stay seated. Let's pray. God, I love you. I thank you for this church. I thank you for my friends. I thank you for my brothers and sisters that are standing. And God, as I think about amazing grace, my shield and portion be for as long as life endures. There's some of us that we're enduring life in here. We need wisdom. It's consuming us. We wrestle with it. We're not sure. We're uncertain. And we're suffering with this. In our own way, in our own know how, maybe some people know, some people don't know, but we're suffering and God I pray for my friends and my brothers that are standing this morning, I pray that as they seek your face, you're the one that told us and I pray your word back to us, you said to seek my face and that's what we're doing and I pray that you would speak to our heart settle our minds and give us the wisdom that we need be with my brothers and sisters as they seek your face for wisdom. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. The second prayer I have this morning is praying when you're suffering through news or action or events that have shaken you. You have an unsettled heart. You're shaken. Something has you shook. Something's happened in your life, and it has shaken you. You don't know what to do about it. People ask you all the time, they say, well, you're not really yourself. I don't know what, no, I'm fine, I'm fine. But what you're not telling them is, I'm shaking. I'm struggling, man. This happened, but you don't tell them. Or this happened, and you do tell them, and they don't understand, but you're shaking. It's shaking you. Your world's upside down. I want to pray for you if you're shook this morning in some way, shape, or form. If you are, would you please stand? Bible says in Psalm 62, 5 through 6, my soul wait in silence for God only. For my hope is from Him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold. I shall not be shaken. Trust in Him at all times. Now listen to what He says. I want you to listen to me. Oh, people. See, when you get shaken, it makes you back up and you keep things to yourself, right? You're shook. You pull away in fear. And Jesus says, you shall not be shaken. Oh, people, watch him. Pour your heart out before me. God is our refuge for us. When you're shaken, the Bible says, pour your heart out. Give it to me. Stop trying to be the tough guy. I got you. And stand on the rock. Let's pray. God, I love you. My brothers and sisters that are here, you're shaken. It takes an enormous amount of courage to say that, but they are. Something, an event, news, relationships, loss. Shaking them. 
not sure where to go, what to do, but God, your word says that when we come to you to pour our hearts out, don't keep it back, but to say it, share it with you, put it there, lay it at the foot of the cross, and even though we're not strong enough, and even though we're not the rock, we can stand on the rock. You are our refuge. You are our rock. So I pray for my brothers and sisters who are shaken, who've been shook, who are healing, who are recovering, who are trying to get their legs back under them, that while they're still in that moment, that God, your word would be true, that we could stand on the rock so that we will not be shaken. Heal their hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Third prayer I've got is for the broken heart. Praying when you have a broken heart. When your heart is hurting with the why of loss and pain. And I'm specifically, not exclusively, but specifically talking about the loss of a loved one. There's men and women within the sound of my boys, uh, voice, uh, boys and girls within the sound of my voice, you've lost a loved one. It doesn't mean it has to happen yesterday or this month or this year even. Maybe in the past three years, four years, five years. But that loss, you miss them. It's not the same messed you up man and there's not a hug on this planet that can take it away but you struggle with it your pastor knows and I can't fix it I would but I want to pray for you so if you're struggling through loss this morning would you please stand with me hear my words the Bible says oh death where is your sting that is to come it doesn't mean it doesn't sting now understand that death is harder on the living and I want you to know I'm proud of you and I want you to know I love you and I want you to know as your as your pastor if I could heal your heart from that, I would. The Bible says, listen to these words. Psalm 147.3, He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. So my children, when they're little, like Memphis, if they run or they fall down and they scratch their knee or something, they come up and they're screaming and they see the wound, right? And they'll come running to me and go, Dad, Dad, or Mom, Mom, I'm bleeding. And they're falling apart. And you know what I do? As a dad, I pick them up, and we go to the bedroom, and we go into the closet in the bathroom, and I get out a little blue tub, and in the blue tub is Band-Aids. And we got a little secret recipe of stuff in there that we fix every cut with, as long as it doesn't need stitches, is we get out a thing called Neosporin. I can't tell you how many times I've gotten the Neosporin out and I've gotten the Band-Aid out. And in the moment of fit of pain, I put the Neosporin on it. I take the Band-Aid out and put it on the wound. And instantly, the crime stops. It wasn't the Neosporin that stopped the crime. It was the love and the caring of the bandage from the Father. I want you to hear my words this morning because I know your heart's grieved and it's just an open wound. And you may have to do this every single day when you get out of bed. And go to the closet with Jesus and let him get his band-aids out because he will bind up your wounds with his love. And the stinging may never stop. And your heart may always be broken. But he will bind up the wounds of your loss word says he does it through memories of the righteous I want to pray for you God I love you thank you for these men and women that's in the sound of my voice I said it the first service I'll say it again I didn't become a halfway decent pastor until I lost my grandfather and the brokenness that you endure that lasts every single day for the rest of your life for the person that you love Jesus it hurts and we don't know what to do 
But your word says you heal the brokenhearted, and so I'm asking for that. I hand you all these hearts this morning. We heal them. And while you're healing them, will you hold them? Just hold them. They're fragile. You said you'll bind up our wounds. Would you please, please bind up our wounds, please? I'm so proud of them for standing. But you're the only one that can heal their heart, and I pray that you do. I pray you peace and comfort that passes all understanding. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to take four and five and put them together because I'm way out of time. And when I get finished praying this prayer, my friend Beth has been so gracious. She's my new friend to come in, I think, Crossville or somewhere like that. Because, yeah, I'm Crossville this morning. And she's going to play the bagpipes. And I told you Amazing Grace earlier in the service. And that's what we're asking Jesus to do is to have grace. And this morning as we close out, after I pray, she's going to come up here and she's going to stand on the stage. And from those bagpipes, she's going to play Amazing Grace over us. And when she's finished, we're finished. And I want you to walk out of here this morning under grace. Because some of us are just saying, grace. A shielded portion B. Some of us are needing that grace. And I like the way that she plays it. And it's going to be the way that we end this morning. The last people I'm praying for this morning is this. I want to pray for those who are suffering through fear because of bad news. There's several within the sound of my voice that were here this morning, maybe even to hear or not here today. They're scared. They've gotten bad news. Specifically cancer. There's no need to beat around a bush about it. Cancer. It's wreaking havoc in our community. The individual. Addiction. But you got bad news and you don't know what to do. You're scared. You're fearful. This is what that grace does. It relieves my fears. And the fifth person is those that say, I'm just suffering through weakness. I can't take any more spiritually. I'm tired. I can't can't Satan pick on somebody else? That's you. Can he just pick on somebody else? I want to pray for you. So if you're one of those categories, would you please stand? I want to read this scripture to you, and I'm going to pray. But the Bible says in Psalm 56, 8, You have taken account of my wanderings and my troubles. You've put my tears in your bottle, and they not written are they not written in your book? In God, whose word I praise in the Lord, whose word I praise in God, I have put my trust. I shall not be afraid. For what can man do to me? Psalm 73 says this, My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. And as you walk through these moments, I want you to know I'm praying for you. And I love you, and God has taken into account all that you're dealing with. Do not be afraid. But here's what I'd like to happen. I'd like for everybody to stand at this time before I pray. And I'm going to pray. And if you're standing by somebody and you just want to touch them or you want to put, put your hand on their shoulder, you want to hold their hand, or while I pray, if you want to pray over them, whatever you feel like doing, but I'm going to pray. And then Miss Beth's going to play Amazing Grace. And feel free to sing along if you can. And then we'll be dismissed. Let me pray. God, I love you. I thank you so much for this morning. God, there's so many things that we struggle with. So many things that we're suffering with. Loss. Health. Addiction. Friends. Some of us in here, we're not suffering ourselves. But we're watching others suffer, and we want it to stop, but we can't. But your, your word says that you will not fail, that you will never leave us nor forsake us. God, I can hear John Newton writing across the parchment now. I can see his, his 
his quill pen as he dips it in to write with ink amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me I once was lost but now I'm found I was blind but now I see now that I see God will you hold me would you heal me would you help me would you help those who just need a touch of grace as we suffer I love you, I praise you, and even in light of the suffering, it pales in comparison to the fact that I can say I'm a child of the King this morning. I love you and give you praise for that amazing grace. In Jesus' name, amen.